Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Gaynor. Uh, I'm going to talk about why Ruby isn't slow, uh, particularly why basically all about you, probably all the preconceptions you have about Ruby's performance and dynamic language performance in general are really, really wrong in this era. So five seconds of background, I work at Rackspace, uh, and I'm by and large a Python programmer. There's actually almost no Ruby code in here. Uh, there's a lot of Python code, though, and I do a lot of open source stuff. You can ask me about that later. So start with what is the statement that, you know, sort of I'm making this indictment of, that Ruby is slow. And unfortunately, this is, this is a thing we say a lot. This is a thing people say. It's not a really precise statement. And since I'm basically building this talk on the premise of attacking its validity, I want to unbox at least what I think people mean when they make the statement, Ruby is slow. And of course, almost everything in this talk, besides some real specifics, apply to Python. It applies to JavaScript. It applies to Lua. It applies to probably whatever your favorite dynamic language is too. It's not real Ruby specific. It's about the sort of set of dynamic languages we basically wrote in the 90s and we wrote while ignoring a whole bunch of research about how to make these fast. <laughs> so what we mean when we say Ruby is slow is code written in Ruby executes CPU bound tasks more slowly than other languages. This is sort of the precise version of that, except for it's missing details too, because we are not talking about the fact that when we say code written in Ruby executes, we're not talking about how it executes. We're implicitly thinking it runs on MRI or C Ruby or C Python or whatever like that. Uh, we're not talking about, uh, you know, maybe it's a different on different CPUs. We are talking about CPU bound as opposed to I/O bound, um, and we're talking about it relative to other languages. There's no absolute performance of like this is how fast we think computers should be. We're saying it's slower than we'd like to be, where what we'd like it to be is some other language that is fast. And of course, if you, if you go to someone and say, why did you choose Ruby, uh, you know, it's so, so slow, you get a lot of bad answers back. And these answers are not the bad answers this talk is going to give. So common answers include, our app is I.O. bound. We write web apps. It's so cool. You don't have to care about CPU speed at all. I got to tell you, there's an amazing correlation between people who will tell you, oh, my app is I.O. bound, and apps that you like trivially find 30% performance improvements in by changing purely like CPU bound code. It's amazing the correlation. You also get, you know, we make it up with programmer productivity. That might be a true thing. I think dynamic languages are super productive things to write code in. That is in no way a response to you execute CPU bound sl code slowly. And finally, in my opinion, the most depressing one, uh, later when we actually need it to be fast, we'll rewrite it in C or Scala or Java or SML or some other super uh, cool popular language that, you know, really is fast. It's a proper serious language. This one makes me sad because I'm a compiler nerd and we figured out how to make these things fast and people seem, they seem hell-bent on abandoning, you know, what I think are a set of really good languages for writing stuff in. So Ruby can be fast, it is not necessarily slow, and so to start with that I want to break down even further what are the myths about why we think it's slow. And this is like the 100 answer I get from almost 100% of people, why is Ruby slow? Well the compiler doesn't know the type, so it's, so it's slow. You know, what does that mean? Uh, the, you know, you don't put types in your program. You don't infer them. It's not a type inference language. So uh, the compiler can't optimize. Why can't it optimize? It doesn't know the types. Okay, so what? What, is it, what does that actually mean? What are the consequences of not having types? What are the actual performance consequences, we think, of not knowing the types? So all function calls are indirect. You know, if you got an assembly program, you tell them, oh, this is an indirect jump, they get, like, they get really, like, freaked out. Like, oh, you know, that's... It's going to have bad branch prediction. It's going to flush some caches. That's really uncool. Uh, we have that. That is a wishful, really nice uh, idea in you know practical dynamic languages. In these interpreters, what this means, you're probably going to do a hash table lookup. You're doing this indirect function call. You know the way the indirection is a hash table. Hash table lookup is about 40 nanoseconds. Good hash table on a modern x86. You know recent Intel CPU. 40 nanoseconds sounds cheap unless you're trying to do it on almost every operation in your programming language, right? 40 nanoseconds all the time compared to nothing is really, really slow because nothing is the cost in these other languages for this stuff. Uh, all containers are objects, so, you know, you make an array of ints in, uh, in C. In uh, Python, uh, make, uh, you make an array of uh, integers, you make a list of integers. 
what you get is you get a nice uh, array of pointers to some that memory that contains an integer and a bunch of other stuff. So objects are way fatter, more pointer interactions, that's expensive. Uh, instance variables, attributes, whatever your language calls them, they're not at fixed memory offsets. If you ever look at like the assembler GCC emits when you read a field out of a struct, you get, a, you get this uh, mob with the weird uh, addressing, just read it in offset. Python, Ruby, it's like, let's go find a thing in a hash table. Another 40 nanoseconds. So what if we were actually going to design a fast Ruby? And I don't mean a, a language that looks like Ruby, it's fast. I'm talking about a fast VM, a fast interpreter. Uh, something that really addresses these problems, looks at the architecture of how we represent data, uh, looks at you know, making these things be as free as we think they ought to be. So to address that, we've got this tool called RPython. RPython is a programming language. It is a statically typed type inference programming language. It's globally type inferenced. Uh, you don't write types anywhere. <clears throat> but uh, it compiles down to uh, you know, binary. It's a garbage collected language. Uh, it's got a nice, fast, modern, generational garbage collector. Pretty cool. Uh, and the syntax is the same as Python. It's, it's actually uh, basically a strict subset of Python code. And so why would we use this language? And the answer is you probably should never use it. R Python is a, probably one of the worst languages I've ever programmed in. It has bizarre semantics, error messages that are atrocious. They're not long. They're, they're real short. They usually all fit on a terminal. You can understand them. The errors point to places nowhere near like mistakes in the code are. The UI is atrocious. You should never use this. If all you wanted was a type inferenced garbage collected language, there's a lot of good ones, many of which have been presented at this conference. Probably you should just go uh, use one of those. But R Python's got one thing nobody else has. It's got a just-in-time compiler generator. So in addition to being a terrible language, it is a framework for writing high-performance dynamic languages on top of it. Uh, so while many uh, VMs write their own just-in-time compiler from scratch, meaning everything from looking at code and figuring out how you want to type specialize it to emitting assembly, you know, something like V8 or Luigit, you know, where they write the full stack, if you use R Python to build a uh, to build a dynamic language, you don't have any of these steps. All of this stuff comes for free. And as a part of that, there are lots of useful primitives that you want when you're actually going to go implement a dynamic language. Uh, lots of little tools that make it easier. And so it's built using a tracing JIT. Uh, tracing just-in-time compilers have been a thing for a while. You probably heard of them because uh, TraceMonkey, uh, the original uh, JIT engine from Firefox, was a tracing just-in-time compiler. Basically, what that means is uh, tracing JIT observes the execution of your code. Usually, uh, the unit it observes, is it l observes a loop. And it looks and figures out what code paths are hot. And then it compiles a linear trace, so a linear sequence of instructions uh, that represent that with bail points. So any place you have an if or there's an implicit if, it basically has what's called a guard. And what that means is we are not handling this. That, that will be handled elsewhere. Like just jump out to the middle of nowhere and ignore that when trying to consider the optimization of these programs. Let's look at an example. This is a function. It's technically like implements the Colatz conjecture. I don't know why that's significant. It's a thing. It's a simple function. Fits on a slide. There's probably a math person here who understands that. Uh, so oh, this function's written in R Python. Uh, looks a lot like Python. Uh, and so these are real like machine integers. And let's say we were to JIT this. So there's no dynamic type checking. There's actually no overhead we wanted to remove. We want to look at what sequence operations uh, we observe. So first iteration through this, what we're going to observe is we, you know, we have a loop. So we have this loop. And the input variable to the loop is n. And so the first thing we do is check if uh, n is not equal to 1. And uh, it, we, get, you know, we get i0 back, automatically numbered variables in this uh, representation, guard true. So any time you get to the instruction afterwards, the i1 equals, i0 must be true. If it was false, we would have like jumped out. We would have stopped running this code. There's fallback code that deoptimizes and figures stuff out. Then we and uh, n with 1. Uh, we check if that's equal to 0. Uh, we guard that that's true. And then we do division. And then we jump back to the head of the loop. Uh, it's pretty simple. There's not a lot of like overhead. We could have written this function and compiled it in C. And like there was no overhead. Uh, because there's no dynamic language, there's no, there's no dynamicism we want to remove from this. But these are the concepts. This, the whole guard concept is the critical thing uh, to understanding tracing JITs. So the key insight to dynamic languages is that there is all things that are almost certainly true, but not certain. Uh, and this is a thing you can't really communicate to a C compiler. The, 
in C, you know, a struct has these fields. It doesn't almost always have these fields. <laughs> a function, either, a reference to a function either is or is not constant. It's either this is a totally, uh, this is a totally uh, indirect jump or this is a direct jump that you can like inline and call or whatever. There's no, this is almost always the case. And that's, that's the key bit. That's why traditional static compilers don't work for dynamic languages. Because you can't give them these maybes, these probabilities, these almost definitely, I swear, but not actually sometimes. So this is kind of what the Ruby object model looks like if you simplify things and like remove all the details and you have no inheritance and you know, you remove tons of details. You have class objects and they have, they have a hash table of methods. You can add methods to them and add method can really be used to redefine an existing method. You can find methods, look them up by name. You have instances, instances have a class. You can send methods where you find the method and you call it. And you can see there's a lot of details missing like you can't send a function, uh, you can't send arguments with uh, your calls. You don't have uh, inheritance. You can't include modules into classes. There's tons of details missing. But this is sort of the core of the Ruby object model. And so this sucks. Uh, so particularly it sucks for performance. Because when, uh, when you call send, you're going to go find method. Find method's going to do a dictionary lookup, the hash table lookup. That's 40 nanoseconds we just wasted. Time spent not doing things you care about your program doing. Time spent in the VM doing bookkeeping, basically. Slow. But uh, we, we know in practice, 99% of the time, if you call send with the same name to the same class, you're going to be getting the same method back. So we want to find a way to express this to our computer. We want to find a way to express this to the machine. So our Python gives us a couple primitives that will hopefully let us expose the almost always logic. Uh, so we talked about guards, and uh, now we're going to look at you know, what are these tools that we have for writing dynamic languages. So, First one we have is called elidability, which is kind of a weird word. It's not really used anywhere else uh, in computer science literature that I've seen. Uh, basically, an elidable function, the rule is, you must be able to re replace the result of calling this function with an obser a previously observed result. So if you know that all the arguments to this function are constant, replace it with the result. Uh, this property is also called referential transparency. An important thing about uh, elidability is that you're allowed to elide things like caching. Uh, so if a function will also put something in a cache, you can still elide it. So this is, this is maybe where we try to start, right? It's find methods elidable. It's not quite right, though. What if you called uh, add method again afterwards? Then you have this previously observed result that's no longer accurate. You've, you've changed the result value. It's, it's not true. It's, Elidability is not a sufficient tool. Elidability is sort of a static style tool, like this always, this is always something that's not uh, sufficient for us. Uh, so the next tool we have is called uh, promotion. And uh, promotion ties in very closely with guards. Promotion says, when you observe a result of this, generate a guard that the next time it'll be true. So we've got this f function that promotes its argument and then does uh, some serious computing. Uh, so we call, we call f with uh, 10. The uh, code that will be emitted for that promotion will be, we will observe that uh, 10 was passed. So we, we called promote with 10. What that emits is, we, that emits the code, check if uh, x is equal to 10, uh, because 10 was the result we observed. So this is how we generate guards. And of course, in future code, when you, when you go to execute that, when you go to turn int equal and guard true into machine code, uh, Everything afterwards, i0, anytime you see it, you'll be able to just replace with 10. Because now we know it must be, uh, it must be 10 because we checked. Basically, guards and uh, promotion is used for when you have something that's really cheap to check for, but allows you to avoid really expensive computation. So next thing we have is called quasi-immutability, which is by far my favorite term we have, with the possible exception of the black hole interpreter. Uh, I won't talk about the black hole interpreter. We have lots of really cool terms. Uh, Quasi-immutability is sort of super cool. Uh, it's also super obscure. I, I just have to like apologize on behalf of the syntax. A question mark? I don't even know what that is. It, this was not a thing that was designed, clearly. So quasi-immutability is for expressing you know, the core of this concept, a field on an object which almost never changes. So almost word again. So our Python uh, has a cool JIT. It does cool tricks. 
So basically when you read a field that's marked as quasi-mutable, what happens is it will observe the fact that this read occurred, but it won't emit any code. So there's no code emitted for quasi-mutable reads. And it just replaces that with the known value. But it keeps track of the, the fact that it made this assumption. It just reused a value without doing any checks. But now whenever you write to this field, you'll have to just go blow away all your old assembler. You just blow it away. It's now totally useless. So this is for you know, serious, almost never changes territory. So now we've got a couple primitives, a couple different uh, pieces, a couple tools. We've got to put them all together and actually build a system. No one of these is enough to actually implement a fast dynamic language. So here is now the optimized version. Uh, no joke, all fits on one slide. This is all we need. Uh, method lookups are totally free. Take uh, no basically no assembly instructions. So what do we change? We added that uh, we added this version field starts at zero and it's uh, it's quasi immutable. We added this indirection over find method. So now find method just calls undefined method with uh, with its version and find undefined method is now elidable and send does promotion on its class and uh, promotion on the name. So what does this mean? What does this actually look like if we try to invoke this code? So we've got this really cool code, uh, my object. Uh, we uh, send the method, a method to it. Super cool code. You probably write a lot of it. It's worth remembering that even in Ruby, something like plus or minus is a method send just like this. So you're sending methods all over the place. Imagine this being whatever method you like. So we start getting inside a send. And uh, first thing we do is promote the class. So first thing we do is we read the field class. That's what a get field does, just reads a field, pretty intuitive. Uh, and this is like a C struct style field. So get field is like one mob instruction with an offset. And we check that uh, we compare it, class is a pointer, we compare it to some observed my class and guard true. So mid a couple guards. Uh, we promote the name. So now, uh, you know, a method was constant in our, uh, in our source code. That's sort of promoted, we still promote it again uh, in case it hadn't already been a constant from the source code. Like if we done send with a variable, something like that. Uh, emit a guard again. So now we inline into find method and we add a few more things. So we read the version uh, out of it. We were read the version out of the class, which was p0 from before, and we call find method. Uh, we don't inline into it. Uh, we just make a call to it with the class and with the version we just observed. This is the code we've got. And uh, of course, hidden inside this find method, looks like we've got it. You know, it's real pretty. It's like seven instructions. But it's actually, it still sucks in all the ways it sucked before, as far as we can see. Because hidden inside find method is uh, this nasty dick lookup, this nasty 40 nanoseconds. So let's look at what happens. So the first thing that happens is we can eliminate this PTR equal on uh, the string with this observed constant string. It's always true that uh, you know, these two constants are the same as each other. So that one goes away. This becomes uh, guard true, true. We can remove guards. It's constantly, provably uh, true. It can go away. Just delete it. So now we get this. So now we talked about the fact that any time after you've guarded for something, you can just replace it with uh, the known value thereafter. So this get field becomes get field from a constant uh, with this version. So because version is quasi-immutable, now we can go ahead and just replace that whole thing uh, with some observed value, pretend it's 10, whatever. Uh, and so no notice we also replaced uh, p0 with uh, the, my class, this constant again. And now we're calling a find method with two constants. Find method was elidable, so all of its arguments are, are constants. Uh, that means we can just replace it with some observed result. And so now we're down to just three, uh, three instructions, actually. And each of these is basically a one-to-one -one mapping with the CPU instruction. So from these 25 lines of code, we've managed to reduce ourselves to no hash table lookups, uh, no 40 nanoseconds wasted, three instructions. And the cool property is if then we sent another, uh, we, did, we did another send on my object, we'd be able to totally reuse these. These would be true for any call site. So if we need multiple back-to-back -back calls, the second one would have not even these three instructions. And so the real result is uh, a thing I wrote called uh, Topaz. Topaz is, as perhaps you're expecting, uh, a Ruby interpreter built on top of RPython. And it has this optimization and many others. 
It's not totally complete. That is, you probably can't run your Rails app or your Chef app, since those are, as far as I can tell, the two things people do with Ruby. They run uh, Rails and Chef. Uh, so you can't run those, but it can run a lot of Ruby. In, particularly, in particular, it runs uh, thousands of specs out of Ruby spec, which is the unofficial official test suite uh, specification for Ruby. It runs uh, quite a bit of that, thousands of specs worth. It has some other optimization, so Ruby also has constants. Constants are cool in that they are in no way constant and may vary. <laughs> its naming is possibly literally an impossible thing to do. Um, so you can do this exact same optimization, right? Constants have the exact same property that methods have in that they're almost constant, almost always the same. So same sort of logic applies. Uh, you can do a similar thing with instance variables uh, using the same sort of primitives except using a structure called a map, which is a thing that's been around since about 1988 and which neither uh, C Python nor C Ruby nor Perl nor basically anything besides like V8, LuaJIT, PyPy, Rubinius, things like that implement. Uh, it's pretty impressive how much research we can ignore. We can also do type specialization. So instead of uh, doing the traditional dynamic language thing, which is put everything in a box, right? Uh, you put your integers in a box. Just, uh, oh, you one of those eight bytes? Yeah, put that on the heap in a box. We can do type specialization. We can do type specialized containers. Those are at, type specialized containers aren't actually like a super novel thing, right? You just observe the fact that you keep putting integers inside of an array and uh, then decide I'm just going to store raw integers and have a fallback mode. But uh, the win you get is way better with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an otherwise high performance JIT. So all these optimizations exist in uh, Topaz. Uh, if you're interested, there's a whole bunch of links. Uh, so PyPy.org, R Python is the implementation language for PyPy, which is the high, which is the high performance uh, just-in-time compiler for the Python language. We have a bunch of benchmarks at speed.pypy.org. Shows a geometric mean of 6x improvement over C Python. The source code for PyPy and Topaz is all open source. Topaz's website is online. Uh, I imagine there's going to be quite a few questions about this, so go ahead and hit me. Uh, photo credit goes to Brian Curtin. Thank you, guys. So yeah, uh, question. Uh, Do you have metrics on what your speed up is on Topaz versus MRI? Sure. So uh, Topaz versus MRI, the question was, uh, are there benchmark results? Yes, I have some preliminary benchmark results. <clears throat> uh, I don't like to cite them because they're mostly micro benchmarks, but they show about what you'd expect, which is anywhere from like 2x, 2x to about 500x, depending on the kind of code you write. This is, this is the sort of nature of dynamic language speedups, and I think we've entered a really cool uh, era. There was an era where basically the speedup you got, you could basically measure because you were deleting this constant factor overhead. Interpretation overhead, you know, by getting rid of the interpreter loop and moving to some assembly, you got rid of a certain type of overhead that was basically constant throughout programs. And so you got improvements like consistently 2x. We can't really cite numbers like that anymore because now we're actually getting closer to you know, how much overhead was there. And the overhead uh, from factors like boxing, from factors like these hash table lookups are dependent on the code. So if you do code that does actual lookups in like a hash object in a loop, we don't get much wins because those are spending a lot of their time in the runtime, you know, inside an actual hash table for a thing that really is a hash table. But if you spend your code doing uh, numerics uh, that's wasting a lot of time in these method lookups, that's where we get wins like 500x. So yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Do you think there's a path for any of this into MRI? No, there's probably not a path uh, for any of this to land in MRI. Uh, I, I've never spoken to any of the MRI maintainers, but I can give you the conversation we have with uh, the C Python maintainers on the PyPy side pretty regularly. And basically the conversation goes like, hey, we've proved there are these great wins, uh, but it means throwing away all your existing code uh, and you know, adopting the new world order. You know, For a lot of good reasons, uh, that doesn't want to happen. Uh, it's, there's more complexity in the system. So I, I think hopefully, uh, uh, just go back a little. Hopefully this has uh, demonstrated the idea that there's no need to be, 
There's no need to have complexity in the VM itself to express these ideas, but there is complexity to the system, right? Compared to the you know, naive interpreter loop, everybody who took like a interpreter or compilers course in CS heard about, like there's complexity, you're emitting assembler at runtime, it's not simple. So, you know, people like the CPython or MRI maintainers who are more interested in language design questions uh, don't necessarily want to move themselves to having a just-in-time compiler and doing these optimizations. So what I think needs to happen is what happened in the JavaScript world where a bunch of VM implementers, you know, gave the world a gift and didn't give people a choice about using it. Uh, so the reason there's a lack of adoption for systems like JRuby and Rubinius or PyPy on the Python side is basically because they've abandoned certain, uh, you know, albatrosses around our necks. What am I talking about? Whole bunch of giant piles of C code, C extensions basically. Uh, I know both JRuby and MRI have some level of support for them. It will, I imagine, never be truly complete. Uh, just like PyPy's support for CPython C extension will never be tru truly complete and truly great. We need to, fundamentally Java people got this right uh, like 15 years ago when they convinced people to abandon their C code and rewrite everything in Java. And you don't even have to totally abandon your C code. So PyPy has this thing called CFFI. It also runs on CPython. It's similar to Ruby's FFI library. It lets you load C code, but not C code written for MRI. C code written to be C code. And so I think if we move our extensions, we move our dependencies away from these things, and as users, we, ins we say, you know, these are the systems we're deploying on, we will move, it'll eventually become a world where these things are leading the way rather than, you know, following and implementing every change that happens upstream. And once that happens, I think the language designers will follow. We got to drag them kicking and screaming, I think, is the answer. Do you have any plans in Topaz or PyPy to um, have, like, the programmer hint to the interpreter what, uh, what it wants the compiler to do? So instead of, like, having it jitted, you say, I want, like, this array to be an actual array of integers. So it's a great question. The question was, you know, are there any plans to add hints? You know, for the end user programmer of Python or Ruby to be able to give, uh, you know, basically tell the system, hey, here's a thing I know, basically like we do with static languages. And the answer is sort of. So I can't see a future ever where I think there's a use for adding hints on local variables or things like that. I think where we can get wins, though, are <clears throat> uh, possibly uh, basically around a place I think Java has basically failed, which is a lack of value types. Specifically, you can't do something like say, I have an array of these two pack, these array of two integers, so st structs of two integers, as you would say in C. In Java, you know, you end up with a pointer to an object, you know, takes twice as much memory as the two integers to store all that, uh, plus there's the indirection. Hints to be able to say, I want arrays like that, I think are hugely valuable. And if you ignore the fact that sometimes you want a pointer to a thing, CFFI lets you do this by basically letting you allocate random memory. I imagine FFI in Ruby does much the same. I'm not as familiar with its API, though. Uh, but I think the idea of hints like that and sort of really idiomatic libraries, uh, you know, for doing things like that. Basically, typing around data structures is valuable, I think. Typing around code is not valuable, at least from a perspective of things the compiler needs. So, yeah, so the question is, are there any pathological cases, by which I think you mean, like, things in Ruby that, like, outright make it harder or impossible to optimize? Uh, well, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's actually my question. Like, Hedius turns off object space in JRuby by default because it's, like, so expensive performance-wise just to have it available. Yeah, so object space has this, uh, this thing called object space in uh, Ruby. It's a cool thing. It lets you iterate, like, over every object under the GC's control, uh, which kind of sucks if you're targeting the JVM, because the JVM doesn't give you any introspection into the GC. Our Python's GC do give, does give you enough tools that you can actually write that. It's crazy slow. Each object, which is this method, is like 100 times slower on Topaz, but it works out of the box. Like, you don't need a custom flag. You don't need a custom flag to turn on a set trace func for debugging or for profiling. You, you don't need custom flags for any of this. There's no uh, pathological case I found that makes it impossible to make something fast. 
so far. Uh, probably the most interesting thing I found to make fast was uh, exceptions in their backtraces. Specifically, a uh, Ruby backtrace is different from a Python backtrace in that a Ruby backtrace includes every line number as it was observed at the time uh, you make the, uh, the, at the time the exception propagated, all the way up to the top frame. Whereas a Python backtrace includes all the steps, all the frames that the exception was observed to have been raised through. So if you capture an exception object and pass it around and it only raised through two frames of your 40 frame call stack, you'll only see two frames in the trace back uh, is backtrace. In contrast, in Ruby, even if you only raise the exception through two frames, it goes back all 40. Uh, so the trick to observe is uh, basically if you look at the instruction pointer that the frame above you was at, you can basically record uh, uh, a linked list of all these frames uh, for free. Uh, this is a trick other Ruby interpreters could take advantage of as well. Because uh, right now I know raising an exception is crazy expensive uh, under some of the Ruby interpreters. so. It's definitely a trick that could be taken advantage of. But no, there's nothing crazy impossible. I found lots of things that I would consider pathological cases in Ruby's behavior that just shouldn't exist. But <laughs> that's maybe a different question. OK, uh, probably the most pathological thing I found is there is a global variable. And if you set it, all string comparisons become case insensitive. <laughs> that's the <a> thing. <laughs> and it's there because it was there in Perl and 20 years. and. Yeah. What do you feel like are the realistic speedups? Because my understanding is that a lot of the other um, Ruby implementations, whether it be Mac Ruby and others, have encountered some of these pathological Ruby behaviors and been super fast until they have implemented like that. Yep. So this is a thing. Uh, Lots of uh, people implementing basically any dynamic language hit. Oh, we're so fast. Uh, it's not quite complete yet. But we swear we're so fast. And then they get more complete. And performance like tails off because they were cutting corners. So that was, this was a really explicit design goal I had for Topaz, which was I wasn't going to show anything until it had the corners cut. So I spoke with Charles Nutter, who's one of the lead developers of Rubinius, or sorry, of JRuby. And uh, you know, he actually did a blog post a couple months ago. Here's like the list of challenging things in Ruby. And you know, it's things like you can redefine a method at any point. It's that all integer arithmetic promotes to a big integer on overflow, things like that. And so I mean, a particular point is Topaz is oddly complete in some areas in that it's got set trace func and promotion and overriding methods randomly and evals and bindings and stuff like that uh, while it's missing like methods on array. So I believe Topaz is complete in all the important ways. Yeah, so escape analysis is one of the most important optimizations the R Python JIP provides. Uh, I can walk, I probably can't walk through it in any honesty without like background material. If you search, there's a, if you search, there's a really good paper uh, about escape analysis in PyPy, which is exactly the same, and it has good visualizations that make it easier to understand than me talking would be. So you mentioned earlier that uh, it can't run Rails and Chef, the two things in Ruby. Yeah. Yeah. Out of curiosity, uh, is that, are you ever planning on making it so that they can, or is this a completely different application plan? No, this is, it's missing methods on array and string and random stuff like that that you need to run Rails. Okay. So it's this, more of a center library problem than an, like a Ruby implementation problem, you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I consider the core classes to be part of the language itself. Um, but yes, it's. There, there are parts of the language that are missing. Uh, I can't think of what off the top of my head, but little parts of the language that are missing. But I, we can at least parse like almost every single Ruby file now, stuff like that. It's, it's mostly the missing methods at this point. <coughs> and libraries, bits of the standard library. Have you dealt with encoding yet? That was like a nightmare for a while. Before. No, so encoding is one of the giant completeness places that's missing. Yeah, and people who are familiar with it are just laughing in the background, which is fair. <laughs> <laughs> Do you consider it including, like the standard parts of the Do you consider it including those from like um, Rubinius where they've been funded in Ruby? Yeah, so uh, stealing other people, borrowing, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Producing a derivative work of other people's copies of. <laughs> 
of other people's copies of pure Ruby code is absolutely a thing. So anything that's pure Ruby in uh, like MRI, just taking out right. Uh, some of the stuff that's pure Ruby in Rubinius is a bit more of a challenge because some of it uses uh, special primitives Ruby, Rubinius exposes into uh, Ruby and uh, we don't expose those same primitives. So some of that, but yeah, we actually write a lot of the uh, stuff uh, that we have in like pure Ruby. So we have an array dot uh, each that's pure Ruby, stuff like that. <laughs> Another one of the performance um, criticisms of Ruby is the lack of support for parallel computation. Um, is that a thing in Topaz? So it's not a thing in Topaz yet. There's not even like a no op thread that green threads. Uh, basically, I've been deferring because uh, one of the ongoing areas of research work in PyPy is software transactional memory support. Uh, so I'm waiting to basically see what the results of that research are before making a decision about direction. PyPy right now has a global interpreter lock in the same way MRI or CPython does. Yes. Uh, okay. This is everyone. Thank you. <laughs>